The only car I ever owned was a Mitsubishi Colt. It was 13 years old when I bought it. I had little experience buying cars, driving, or about cars in general. I bought this car because I was moving from the Netherlands to the south of Spain. And I knew that in my new hometown, I would depend on a car to go just about anywhere. So I took the journey down south in three days, on my own, with my car full of stuff. The first two days were overwhelming, terrifying. I hated driving, especially on the Paris Ring Road. My car would start shaking if I would try to get anything close to 100 kilometers an hour, and I needed to check and refill the oil multiple times a day. But on the third day, I started enjoying my road trip. I felt free. I felt liberation on the open road. The sun was shining, I had my window open, the music on, my hair in the wind. I felt a little bit like Thelma and Louise, just without Louise and in a very ugly car. <laughs> I felt like my life as an adult had now really started, and that's where my car addiction kicked in. Freedom has, since the very beginning, been the promise of the automobile. Freedom, adventure, independence. And this has also been the main message of car commercials since about 1920. And marketing worked well, because today, almost 100 years later, we still view the car as a symbol of freedom. And this message also helped us to shape the relationship that we have with our cars. And we all know that the bond we have with our car is much deeper and much more emotional than with other things that we own and that are just functional, like our washing machine. Some of us would even rather ditch our partner than ditch our car. And who of you has never talked to their car or even given their car a name? Would you also name your TV or your fridge? But this freedom we gained comes at a price. Because the feeling of being free quickly disappears when we're stuck in the almost inevitable traffic jam. Cars are polluting and they have a big impact on the environment. And the car took over our public space too, space that should be available to all of us, like parks, plazas and streets. It's quite common that cars occupy about 50% of public space in towns, and all of that for free often, or at least at a price that non-car owners would gladly pay for 14 square meters of extra house, garden, storage, or even a picnic table. We shaped our cities around a car and its ever-growing hunger for infrastructure. And what is really worrying is that today, we still buy cars in great numbers. And population is growing. Imagine people living in countries with low car ownership, making different choices because of growing economical welfare. What if we would all own a car, or even two or three, which is not uncommon? Where would we park them? You don't need to be a rocket scientist to calculate that seven billion cars and counting would not fit, and that the car would no longer represent freedom. The car is a very practical way to get around, and sometimes even the only way. What if you need to move your sofa, or if you need to carry your plumbing tools with you all day long, or if you live in a very rural area or depend on your car for your daily commute? But on a larger scale, the car is a very inefficient way to move people because a car stands parked 95% of its time. That's 23 out of 24 hours. And this 5% of time that the car is in use, it carries only 1.2 to 1.5 persons. That is a lot of wasted space and energy. What is different today is that we no longer need to own a car to use one. There are plenty of available cars around, in theory, 95% of all cars. 
Alternatives are becoming widely available. Smart and shared, new transportation solutions come to life in vast speed. A lot of cities are investing in cycling infrastructure. The automated vehicle is within sight, and smart algorithms are starting to bring all the transportation options together in one app. So, the tendency is to think that the end of car ownership is near because technology is here. But it's not technology, it's us. We overlook our idea of freedom and our love affair with the car. We are addicted. When I moved back from Spain to the Netherlands, I faced a dilemma, hold or let go. I decided to take the leap and let go of my car because the car was a burden to me. It was very expensive. It needed a lot of maintenance. I never knew if I could rely on it. I would spend a lot of time finding a parking space because it was never the fastest way to move around. And over time, I re-evaluated my need to own a car again and again. When my commute to work got longer, when all the people around me started owning cars, and when I became a family of four. But the burden was always bigger than the benefit. So with the money I saved, I bought a good bike as my preferred mode of transport. I use public transport whenever possible, and I rent a car often enough when convenient or just fun. And I can even afford the luxury of being driven by a taxi sometimes. I choose whatever suits me or my family best and still save money. I realized that the only reason why I even considered owning a car was the fear of the exception. Because we can't stream cars like we can music or films. So what if one day I would really need that car and there wouldn't be any available, like in case of rain or on a popular holiday weekend? But do we really want to live in fear of the exception? It's time to rethink and reframe our idea on freedom to move. What are you afraid of? Do you want to lose or gain freedom? Because it's not technology that's going to save everything and solve everything. It's our fixed ideas, our routines, our current frames. And what does real freedom mean, actually? Is that using your car as a default way to travel just because you paid for it? Is that cities built to facilitate cars? What if we could really be free and have the freedom of choice? Then we could decide to travel differently every day or every trip, depending on the purpose of the travel, the weather, or travel companions, your need for exercise or your need for carrying things with you, or your desire to read or work or app while you're traveling. Imagine having all of these options at your disposal, walking, cycling, scootering, ride hailing, car sharing, buses, trains, and much more, without the massive cost of owning a car. And our public space would become free too. Imagine we could all share our cars and reduce the amount of cars parked on the streets. We could transform that space to pleasant space for social interaction, for green, or for our kids to play. I want to invite you to rethink what freedom to move means for you. And if you really, really need that car, second or third car. And because it's sometimes hard to imagine what we're not used to, let's make it into a challenge, like meat-free Monday or an alcohol-free month. Let's have a car-free month in which you change your habits, you try new ways, and you keep track of your expenses. And you will see it's probably much easier than you imagine. The options are here. The revolution is already happening. We just need to imagine that we can all reshape transportation and our cities by reframing the idea of freedom to move. Thank you.